So beyond the need to start simple and work towards a complex model, which is absolutely important for the need to arrive at a savvy model, your question had a more difficult component, which I will be trying to address in the course of the week. And that has to do with what if the data is not available, right? Yeah. What if you can't, what if the model seems to be telling you you need to add these components in, but you know the data is, is going to be weak in terms of the areas you need to add into the model the extra complexities, the extra endogenous components, right? Um, so what I'll tell you there is um, there's several strategies that you can use. One of the strategies uh, is, first of all, just, just to recognize, and, and this is going to be, this is, this is going to be a shocking thing I'm going to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to utter something shocking. But if you folks have been listening to the White House over the last few weeks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this will not seem shocking at all. Um, so, uh, so <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, um, you can actually learn a lot from a model dynamics and to, to sharpen your thinking even without a lot of data. Okay? Um, you actually can, and there's Many famous models in the model literature, um, examples would be a shelling segregation model is, is sort of first foremost in my mind there, um, uh, that, that basically people have learned a lot from about their understanding of how the world's working without a lot of data to back it up, okay? So it's not to say that data is a showstopper for modeling. It's actually not. Um, but it is a showstopper, in my view, for certain types of questions that your stakeholders might be seeking to answer with the model. There are times you need to tell those in power, the model is not ready to answer that sort of question. And this is one of the shortcomings of the, the modeling literature is often those questions about what's appropriate for a model are not captured in the contributions to the literature. And so you'll see a paper or two about this model that seems really encouraging. And you may say, well, why couldn't we use this model for A, B, or C? And there's a reason for it. It's just not well documented about why that's not appropriate at this juncture, OK? But there's additional things we do. Um, first of all, we think about um, drawing on additional lines of evidence from other jurisdictions or other other contexts that we think could shed a light on, on our context. So so there, you know, you might be looking at relationships between factors as measured in in North America to inform an understanding for Australia. That's not to say you you bring all the data over wholesale necessarily into your model. But you use that to try to understand basically what's plausible for the missing pieces of the model, okay? And, and to ask, okay, if we did plug this data in from North America here, would we see similar gains we get in that study of walkability by Anna D.A. Rue in, in North American context? Would we see a similar thing coming out of our model? So you make use of a broader set of data. Another thing you do is you prioritize your data collection based on the results from this model. Now this may sound like a comp up, but it's not. Because you don't know, before you build the model, often you don't know, you have all these uncertainties, you don't know which of them are really the binding ones, which are the ones that are, that are really gonna limit you. And it's by building the model you say, that uncertainty, man, if we could get that uncertainty pinned down, we could do a lot better because if the model's really sensitive to it, or maybe it's a governing factor of which of these interventions seems best, et cetera. And you know, I've been in cases where I've put down between ten and twenty thousand dollars for exactly that reason, because our model said that one is the one you need to know about. Get that data. Um, but it hasn't always been simple. I remember one case where waiting for administrative data, population-wide administrative data of the most exquisite sort, for no less than four and a half years to inform this understanding of my model. So what did we do in the meantime? I didn't sit back and, and, and say, okay, not here yet, you know. Um, um, uh, no, what I did in the meantime is I, 
went and I found uh, some data from other studies which have been um, uh, which have been conducted in, in populations which have some significant overlap and I can use that data um, in there as a you know to, to, to make contributions uh, you know along the way and we've had some great publications American Journal of Public Health for example that came out based on that data but um, but ultimately, I knew that this data from our local population was needed. And by the way, now we've got it on hand. It's awesome. Three generations interlinked, uh, you know, grandmothers, mothers, children, uh, occurrence of all different uh, risk factors and conditions, population-wide, I mean, great. Um, and and, and uh, I'm really excited to be working with Joanne and Jeff on this. Um, we're we're going to be in great shape because of what the model prior allowed us to prioritize. To do, but we went and we got other data. Another thing we did, in the meantime, was we put our efforts into collection of data about micro behaviors for the populations of interest because the, it was a gap in the literature, and we ended up basically investing in data collection of our own to, to fill in these gaps. So we found collaborators who were interested in you know collecting data from a diabetes and pregnancy clinic in town and. And uh, this is where we ended up using um, smartphone-based data collection for, for gestational diabetes, and it yielded some, um, uh, some very significant uh, pilot data in that area that allows us to now think about much bigger studies that one of our uh, students will be conducting in the next year. And so we ended up investing in sort of additional data collection um, instruments and primary data collection efforts. Um, another thing that you can do that we also have done is actually try out additional model structures that will allow you to probe the issues, different corners of the issue while you are waiting for, you know, additional evidence for, for the particular uh, areas that need to be filled in. So we tried additional modeling strategies, which was good. Um, but um, you know, the fact is that we are working in a world where evidence uh, is often um, problematic and where there's just not the resources to pull in all the evidence we might possibly want. And so we're dealing with a situation where we do need ways of prioritizing our, our data collection and we need, and we actually benefit a lot from a model that we can point to and say, look, this model is telling us this data is extremely important for the powers that be. It can serve as a motivator. And we actually got, got our partners on the data collection side, they ended up contributing much more data than we had originally sought because they saw that it was a well-founded uh, type of, of, of effort. Um, There'll be some additional aspects of this that I'll talk about later in the uh, later in the week, but uh, those those uh, components will be covered after lunch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rather than before. So those are those are some initial comments yeah. on it. I'll have more comments over the course of the week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I would urge you to to think about talking uh, talking with some of the TAs or others about their challenges and Jeff also. I will say one final thing, though, um, even before lunch, and it better be good, I know. Um, the fact is that, ladies and gentlemen, often when we build a model, we are doing so because we want to ask questions about counterfactuals where we're bending the curve. With, so th this, this workshop is about data-informed data modeling, and I'm going to be placing central attention to this need to inform the models with data. But you have to recognize that data is not the end all things. I remember when I first got into health modeling, I was awed. You know, I saw the, the, the national survey instruments available. I saw some of the longitudinal data. And I thought I had gone to heaven. I mean, this is just <laughs> great stuff. And then I realized. You know, it's just like I liked hot dogs when I was young as a kid. And then I learned where they came from. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was awed by the administrative data, population-wide, lifetime, time-long things to capture every prescription, every, you know, appointment, fix on it. It was just amazing. And then I realized that it was entered 
a lot of the ICD-9, ICD-10 codes were entered by, you know, receptionists in the front office who, <laughs> who said, you know, gestational diabetes, it's diabetes, wouldn't it? It would just be diabetes. She was in here for treatment for diabetes. And, and they entered the wrong ICD-9 code, and so that it's horribly off. And, and, you know, appointments are missed in the, in the data record. The point is that the data doesn't come from heaven. And, and our, models, our models are often asking about forays into the unknown in the sense of counterfactuals where the data will be different. And so, yes, we want to build confidence in the model you, by comparing it with the baseline scenario, comparing it with the current situation. But often the goals of the models are to look at situations where the data will not be available. And, and we need to be prepared for sometimes trying models which do not have much evidence behind them, trying multiple models and seeing if they make very different assumptions about what's not known and still yield consistent guidance when it comes to interventions. Because in that intervention context, some significant emergent data we have from the past won't, will no longer be able to, to uh, be, be applicable going forward as what should happen. And we're going to need to be collecting new data anyway, is what my, my point is. Because, you know, we've gone, and we've gone from going around in a circular track where looking backwards is the same as looking forwards to a situation where we're going off-road and we don't know what's there. And if we rely purely on the maps, the road maps that we have from the past, we may, we may be shortchanging ourselves because we're going to be needing to collect new data in many cases after an intervention's in place because the old data doesn't tell us about the relevant associations. And so be bold, try a couple modeling approaches with, with simple variance of the model, see if it yields consistent findings as far as intervention selection. Because sometimes they may be rather different in their assumption, but the point is the same intervention comes up time and time again as, as effective. And you find that your recommendations are robust given those, uh, those assumptions. You still want to prioritize data collection, but, but if you are having consistent, robust, resilient findings despite many, many different assumptions, it's telling you something from that model that may still allow you to go forward in terms of recommendations. So we should be like Indiana Jones, step forward. Step well, <laughs> I'd, I'd skip the whip and stuff, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and hopefully there won't be all the skulls and what was it, scorpions? I can't remember. Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, um, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to present it as swashbuckling as that, but just recognize that you, you don't stop, the lack of data does not mean an end to modeling. The lack of data in some cases means it's more urgently needed to model, to probe things in another way so that you can know what you know, to what degree you're hamstrung to make any recommendations or to what degree you can make recommendations given the evidence that is available without being, you know, um, without shortchanging accuracy. And I think there are many cases where we can do that, okay? Where time after time, it's the same clear picture of, of, of what's needed. And we find that, yes, it'll be nice to get that data, but we can still, we can still operate with confidence. Um, anyway. Uh, we'll come back to it, okay? okay? Time for lunch. Great. Thank you for, for accommodating that question.